Today in the workshop it's episode 9 of the Build a Real Robot series. Today we'll be working with the motor controller. I'll show you the schematic for the controller and how I wired it up on a piece of perf board. We had a few issues last week, but it's all under control now. So welcome to the workshop. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the workshop and to episode number 9 on the series of Building a Real Robot. Now before we get into today's episode, I need to say a few words about last week's episode. In episode number 8, you might have noticed we had a rather abrupt ending and I apologize for that. That was obviously an editing error on my part. The irony is that with everything that was going on here last week, and there was quite a bit going on, not only did I have a failed solid-state drive to deal with, we're also dealing with flooding in my neighborhood. We're actually under a state of emergency right now, and while it hasn't affected the workshop, it's come awful close. And I've been helping out a bit with the sandbag efforts and that, so I didn't get around to looking at the video comments until Monday. Ironically, I was looking at the comments specifically to see some reactions to what I had said at the very end of the episode where I asked people to leave their opinion on something. Well, naturally, there were no opinions because the video got cut off short and you never saw that part. So I do apologize for that. I will take much more care in editing the videos from now on. But at any rate, I just wanted to mention what it was that I had said at the end of the video that you hadn't seen. And that was I wanted a way for us to be able to dialogue more about this project and about all of your robotic projects. I get a lot of great emails from people where they show me pictures of the robots they've built. They're fantastic. I also get a lot of good suggestions inside emails, inside the comments on the articles on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website and of course in the comments of the YouTube videos. But as this project it gets bigger there are going to be more articles there's going to be more videos and it's going to get very hard to correlate all of this together for example if you want to make a comment on episode number three and we're on episode number 23 your comment may never be seen by anybody so I wanted another way for us to dialogue more and what I had thought about doing was creating a forum and I wanted to get your opinion on that now I like the idea of a forum because we can start threads about specific specific items and everybody can contribute and then when people answer everybody else can see the answers and it's one way that you can get all of that information together even if it's three months later you can search for the thread and find the answer. The thing about a forum is that starting a forum you need a moderator and I'm quite busy right now I don't really have the time to moderate a forum and an unmoderated forum is just a it's a mecca for spammers and that. I mean, it just will not last. You'll just end up filling the forum with a whole bunch of junk comments that have nothing to do with the topic on hand, and you just end up shutting it down. So I wanted to get some thoughts that you might have on either creating a forum or creating some other method for us to communicate on this specific project. So please leave your comments in the below the video, and I will go and read them. And uh, now I know at least that you've seen that and I will promise to be more careful in editing my videos in the future. At any rate, let's get on to today's episode. Now today we're back working with the motor controller and I have some wonderful news. We actually have a motor controller. Yes, this is the motor controller that we will be using for DB1. And I've decided to build this using what I originally specified, Arduino Nanos. Now, you might wonder why did I use the Nano? There were three choices actually to use the Arduino Nano, to use the ATmega328 chip by itself, or to use Arduino Pro Minis. Well, I used a Nano with many of you in mind actually. It really would not be my first choice. If I was building this, this for myself, I would be using an ATmega328. If I had made a printed circuit board, Board, instead of wiring it on perf board, I certainly would have used an ATmega328, and if I was having the board populated, I might even consider using a surface mount version of the chip. But I figured that 
since it is wired on perf board, that some of you may not be as comfortable with wiring up perf board as I am. And so even though the ATmega328 really only requires a few extra components, a crystal, a couple of capacitors, and a resistor for each chip, it still is more wiring. And so I thought this would be a lot easier for you to wire up. Now, what about the Arduino Pro Mini? After all, it's a little less expensive than the Nano, and it doesn't have all the additional circuitry like the USB and everything that really isn't going to come into use once the robot is being used. One of the reasons I rejected the Pro Mini was the, actually the location on the Pro Mini of the ad, of the analog A4 and A5 pins because those are also the pins that are used for I2C. Unfortunately on the Pro Mini they are not on the edge of it, rather they are mounted in the middle and they aren't on the same 0.1 inch grid. They're 0.1 inch apart but they're zero, uh, the, but they're 0 0.05 of an inch offset, so they won't fit onto a perf board. Uh, with the connector mounted below the Pro Mini, if you know what I mean. You have to mount it above and attach a cable to it. And that was another point of weakness that I didn't like, especially on the I2C communications. Plus, with the design of DB1 over here, remember, it's going to have this on top of it here. You're going to come pretty close to hitting this shelf with that. So that's why I vetoed using the uh, Pro Minis and went for the Nanos. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to show you the schematic of the motor controller so you can construct one yourself. Then I'll show you this motor controller board in a bit more detail and basically that's what we'll accomplish today. And next time we get together we'll work on the software that is going on to this motor controller. So let's take a look at the schematic right now. So here's the schematic diagram for the motor controller. Now it's really not that difficult to understand, but I'm going to break it down into sections so it's a bit easier to see. Before I do that, let's take a look at the components we're using. There are two Arduino Nanos, a number of different connectors, and a 100 microfarad electrolytic capacitor that I'm using this to filter out power supply noise. Now if you look on the top left side, you will see that there's a 5 volt DC input that that's just a set of screw terminals. Then you will see two sets of connectors, MTR-L and MTR-R. These are three pin connectors and they're being fed out to the Cytron motor controllers. The other two connectors, ROT-L and ROT-R, come from the rotary encoders on the left and right motors, respectively. And the connector you see on the side has mostly the I2C connections. It's got a ground, the SCL, which is the IC, I2C clock, and the SDA, which is the I2C data line. Then it's got another connection called E-stop. Now this is the emergency stop line. When it receives a signal, it'll bring the motors to a halt. And if you recall last week's episode, they will stay halted unless that, until that stop is specifically cleared. Now you'll also notice I show a bit of a gap between the pins on that. That's not an error. What I did is I took out one of the pins on the DuPont connector that I used over here and on the female side, the side that plugs into this, I'm going to plug that actual connection hole and so that way the connector can only fit in one way. There's no possibility of reversing it so that's why I've done that. So let's break down the schematic into its individual components so you can understand it a bit better. Now we'll start off with the power and ground connections, and these are all fairly simple. You'll notice the electrolytic capacitor sits across the power and the ground, and you want to make certain that you get the polarity of that correct. You don't have to use 100 microfarads, by the way. I just happen to use that. Any value will really do. It's not even completely necessary, but I like to do this just in case the power supply lines have picked up any electrical noise. It should filter it out. Now there's also grounds running out to the motor controller connections because they need a ground pin and so it's got grounds and ground and power are both running out to the rotary encoder connections because you need to actually power the rotary encoder with the 5 volts. Now power and ground also of course are connected to the GND and the V in for the power on the Arduino nanos. Now another connection you will notice that differs between the two 
nanos. On the one on the left, I have a ground connected to pin D4. On the one on the right, I have 5 volts connected there. Well, what's going on with that? Well, D4 is one of the digital I.O. pins, and I'm going to be using it as an input. And so on the one on the left, that input will always be held low. On the one on the right, it'll be held high. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to use identical sketches on both of these controllers. I don't want to have to create a sketch that's different for the left controller and the right controller, because the only difference between the two is they will have different I2C addresses. I'm going to use this pin to establish whether I'm running on the left controller or right controller and set my I2C address accordingly. And next week when I show you the code, you'll see how that works. Now moving on to the I2C and the stop. Now this is the stuff that's coming off of the DuPont connector. Now the SDA line or the I2C data line is connected to pin A4, analog input 4, on both of the Arduino Nanos. The SCL or I2C clock line is connected to analog pin 5 on both devices. And the emergency stop is connected to pin D3 on both devices. This is one of the two interrupt pins that the Arduino Nano has, and the emergency stop will cause an interrupt, which in turn will be interpreted as being a stop all the motors command. Now the connection to the encoders, and it's very simple. There is only one output. We've already seen the power and ground connected to these connections, and the a uh, connection is to pin number D2, and it comes from rotary encoder B. Now, you could connect these to rotary encoder A as well. It really makes no difference. I'm not using both of them because I don't need to establish the direction the motors are rotating in because I'm controlling that. But pin D2 is the other interrupt pin on the Arduino Nanos, and so every time a pulse is received from the rotary encoder, it will cause an interrupt on the Nanos, and these, of course, are wired individually, one for the right and one for the left. Now these are the connections out to the Cytron motor controllers. We need two signals to send. We've already hooked up a ground there, but we need a PWM signal, which we're getting from pin D10, and a DIR signal, which is the direction indicator. We're getting that from pin D12. And again, these are independent on both of the controllers. And so once again, here's the complete schematic. So as you can see when you break it down, it really is quite simple. So now let's take a quick look at the board, how it's wired on the perf board. So here's a closer look at the motor controller board I wired up. I just want to show you how I did the wiring on the perf board, especially for those of you who haven't used perf board very often or indeed at all. Now this is a five centimeter by eight centimeter piece of perf board. I've got another one here, a blank one. And these are very commonly available on both eBay and Amazon. I like these ones a lot. They're actually plated through, and the fact that they are plated means they won't oxidize that easily. They're very inexpensive, and they're very high-quality boards as well, too. So as I said, Amazon and eBay are the places you can get boards like this. I've got an example of the type of perf board I wouldn't use over here. Now, this is just a single-sided perf board. It is not plated, so you can see the copper in some places here is already starting to oxidize and these pads are very very fragile because it's not plated through the wrong amount of heat and you'll lift the pad etc they don't provide a lot of security for the components on top of them so I would stay away from this type of a board now let's take a little look at the wiring over here we'll take a look at the wiring on the back here first of all you'll notice I used thicker wire it's a 22 gauge wire for wiring the power and ground that's the uh, black and the red wires you see here and the other wire I used is actually wire wrap wire which I like very much for working with uh, 
uh, circuit boards like this. Now, if you're using wire wrap wire, you do need to get yourself a proper wire stripper, one that can handle 30 gauge wire, which this is. And once you've got one of those, it makes it very, very easy to do. Now, a couple of hints I can give you are do the wiring for the power and ground first, because then those connections can serve to anchor the components on so that you can put the smaller wires on later. Also, you'll notice I've put the uh, nanos onto sockets onto female headers over here and that to me is really important I could have reduced the height by wiring directly but I really don't like doing that in case one fails on me it can be very easily replaced without having to solder things another thing that I would advise you do is solder a few of the connections first on these um, female headers the ones that aren't being used and that'll just help secure everything onto the board but otherwise it's a fairly easy thing to wire up. So if you haven't wired with perf board before, don't be nervous about it. It's really not that hard to use and uh, you should be able to wire up your controller in no time at all. This took me about, I'd say about an hour or so to put together. All right, well that about wraps up our look at the motor controller for today. Hopefully I've provided you with enough information so that you can construct a similar device to this for your own robot. Now, of course, on the article on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website, you will find the schematic for the controller, the same schematic that we looked at in the video, and that should assist you in putting your own motor controller together. Now, while you're on the website, if you haven't done so already, please sign up for the newsletter because I'm going to be giving some more robot news in the newsletter, and it'll also let you know what's going on in the workshop. And in addition to that, the newsletter is the way that you can tell me what content you would like me to create for the regular workshop videos. You'll find the link in every newsletter to a survey where you can give me your opinion on some topics I'm considering and also suggest topics of your own. And if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do that as well. So until the next time we get together, please take care of yourselves and I hope to see you again very soon here in the DroneBot Workshop. Goodbye for now.